Kluss. Welcome to lecture 16. And in this lecture, we're going to talk a bit more about jets. So in some previous lectures, we introduced the idea of two jets, the subtropical jet and the polar jet. Here we're going to talk about some other different types of jets that we often see in the atmosphere and also talk a little bit more about the behavior of jets in the atmosphere. So that'll be the main topic of this lecture. It's all going to be about jets pretty much. So with that, let's go ahead and dive right into it. So the first thing that I want to cover is something called the low-level jet. And the low-level jet is typically referred to as a region of locally strong winds that occurs right around 850 millibars, about one to two kilometers above ground level. And this turns out to be a very consequential uh, wind pattern, especially around springtime in the plains, because this low-level jet is actually responsible for uh, driving a lot of the convective events, including tornado outbreaks uh, in the plains, and to some extent also in the southeast. But then we're going to talk about this in a little bit greater detail when we talk about our severe weather unit. So we got several lectures planned for the severe weather unit, so hopefully you're uh, looking forward to that and getting kind of excited. So we're going to, in that unit, we're going to be tying everything we've learned thus far in t at that point, tying everything we learned up to that point into severe weather. So uh, hope something that, that's something to hopefully look forward to. But again, you can see on this map here, uh, in uh, western Oklahoma, southwest Kansas, there's this region of uh, 30 to 50 knot winds. And again, this is plotted at 850 millibars. So a lot of, lot of wind up there at 850 millibars. Now, the low-level jet is different in several respects. And one of those differences lies in the fact that the low-level jet has a diurnal cycle. It's typically weaker during the daytime and strongest during the nighttime. Unlike, say, the subtropical polar jet, where it stays at pretty much the same intensity regardless of whether it's daytime or nighttime. But we're going to talk about why that's the case uh, in just a few minutes. And the low-level jet is also partially driven by the unique topography found in the plains. So it's partially driven by the fact that we have mountains to the west of us and relatively flat land to the east of the mountains. But the main thing that you want to focus on is the temperature contrast. So the topography can drive the low-level jet, but you can also get a strong low-level jet by other means. And we'll talk more about that. Uh, we'll talk more about the details of that in just a few minutes. And as you saw in the previous map, we saw an area where the low-level jet had winds of 3 to 50 knots. But on occasion, the low-level jet can reach 60, 70 knots. Sometimes it can even get higher than that. So uh, in fact, typically, the more level, more intense the low-level jet is, the uh, more substantial severe weather risk that you might be dealing with. But uh, we'll cover some of those details in the next several minutes. But first, let's go ahead and talk about how exactly the low-level jet forms and why it exists. So, this is going to be building on the idea that we introduced earlier about how the topography plays a role in the formation of the low-level jet. So uh, we'll say that we have some sort of elevated terrain. This is usually just the Rocky Mountains out west. And then here, highlighted in green, that's just going to be the plains. And up here in the mountains, the air is pretty thin. It's um, the, there's not a whole lot of air to be had up in the up in the Rockies, and those of you who've gone hiking, uh, definitely in the mountains, definitely know that's like be the case. Because once you get to the top of the mountains, it's uh, much harder to breathe because the air is so much thinner at those higher elevations. But uh, because the air is so thin up in the mountains, it's very it's much more easy to change the temperature. It's much easier to change the temperature of that thin air on top of the mountains than it is to change the temperature of the thicker air down near the plains. So on a, when it's sunny outside, that tends to result in uh, an area of relatively hot air on top of the mountains, whereas the air over the plains is typically a little bit uh, cooler. It's not nearly as hot as it is over the top of the mountains when you've got the strong heating taking place on this thin air. Temperature rises uh, much more quickly over the mountains than it does over the plains. So if we think about the, this in terms of the concept of thermal winds, so again, if you apply your right-hand rule, and you'll get a thermal wind vector that points from north to south, so you get a northerly quote-unquote thermal wind. And on a typical severe weather day, you're typically going to have a wind that's southerly at the surface. And if you've got a wind that's southerly at the surface, so again, we're just pulling that on a nice little axis here, so uh, in the vertical direction, Z, that's just going vertically up in the atmosphere, and then uh, going to the right is going to the north, and going to the left is going toward the south. And one thing that you can show mathematically is whatever direction the thermal wind points, the wind wants to go in that direction as you increase with height. So if you've got a southerly wind, that is a wind that's blowing from south to north at the surface, and you've got a thermal wind vector pointing in the opposite, a thermal wind vector that's pointing from north to south, then this thermal wind 
the wind wants to go more east, wants to become more easterly with height. Or excuse me, I'm a little confused here. It's uh, it wants to become more northerly with height. Because again, south is pointing this way, north is pointing this way. This is a northerly wind. Because the thermal wind is northerly, then the wind itself, the actual wind, wants to become more northerly with height as you go in the vertical direction. So if our wind is southerly to begin with, and our thermal wind vector points in the opposite direction, the wind's going to weaken, and then at some point, it's going to weaken up to some height, and then after a specific height, it's going to start strengthening and start going in the other direction. So since the actual wind and the thermal wind oppose each other, then you have this weakening in the flow, and this is why the low-level jet is typically weakest during the daytime, because of the fact that the thermal wind vector and the surface wind vector are pointing in opposite directions. Now that is not to say you can't have a strong level of jet during the daytime. In fact, those severe weather events can be particularly scary because those can happen while a lot of daytime events are going on, like uh, daycare, uh, children are in schools, and there's a and uh, a lot of people are at work during that time. So it's if you get a strong level of jet in the middle of the day, that can be a really scary scenario if you're having to worry about severe weather, but a lot, and just a natural tendency, the low level jet tends to be weakest during the daytime, but as with anything else in the atmosphere, there are exceptions to the rule. But in general, low level jet is weakest in the, uh, during the daytime. Now let's see what happens at night. So again, we have this really thin air that's, taking, that's uh, sitting on top of the Rocky Mountains here, and we still have this really thick air, relatively thick air down near the plains. And again, the thin air is going to be subject to the greater temperature changes. It's going to increase or decrease its temperature more rapidly. When nighttime, when, uh, when nighttime hits, this air atop the Rocky Mountains is going to cool a lot faster than it does over the plains. So during the daytime, it heats up a lot faster than the air over the plains, but during the nighttime, it cools a lot faster than it does over the plains. So this means you have a region of relatively cold air on top of the Rockies versus a region of relatively warm air now over the plains. And with the temperature gradient now reverse, now instead of a temperature gradient going from east to west, our temperature gradient now points from west to east. Now our thermal wind vector, if we apply the right-hand rule, is now going to point from south to north. Which if we go back to this diagram, remember whatever direction the thermal wind vector points, the wind wants to go more and more in that direction. So since our thermal wind vector points from south to north, then our actual wind vector wants to go, wants to become more southerly as we go up in the vertical direction. So since our thermal wind vector points from south to north, then the southerly component of the wind wants to intensify as we go up in the vertical direction. And if our actual wind to begin with is southerly, and we have a thermal wind that's also southerly, that means the wind is going the southerly component of the wind is going to intensify as we go up in the vertical direction and this is going to form that strong current of wind near the low par lower parts of the atmosphere because as we go up the winds are going to intensify and this in turn forms the low level jet and this also explains why the low level jet tends to be strongest during the overnight hours but a lot of times in the actual atmosphere the low level jet will start to intensify right around or right just before sunset, right as that dramatic cooling tends to take place over the Rocky Mountains, that's when the southerly wind field at around one to two kilometers above the ground, that's when it typically starts to intensify. It's right around or just before sunset, that's when it starts to intensify, and then it becomes the strongest, the low level jet is strongest during the overnight hours when the cooling is at a maximum. And then sunrise the next day, the heating process begins to take place and the low level jet starts to weaken. So low level jet tends to be most intense during the, uh, during the middle of the night, and it tends to be the weakest in the middle of the day. And some of the physical consequences of low-level jet, some of you probably already uh, know this uh, just coming into this class because you probably have read uh, SPC forecast discussions about the, uh, and they mention the low-level jet a lot, but we'll just go ahead and quickly go through it. So the low-level jet tends to, uh, if you have that increasing southerly flow, uh, what's uh, upwind of that flow. It's the warm Gulf water. So if that southerly wind is becoming stronger, you're going to be bringing in richer moisture and more unstable air into uh, your environment, which is going to significantly decrease the atmospheric stability. It's going to make the atmosphere a lot more unstable. And you can sort of see this if you go back and look at severe weather events. You have a pretty isolated thunderstorm coverage during much of the afternoon and early evening. And then once that low-level jet kicks up in the middle of the night, the thunderstorm coverage dramatically increases because you're bringing in that air that's a lot less stable than it was during the daytime. And 
this is something I kind of already just alluded to, but this can lead to uh, additional thunderstorm development, and it can lead to very rapid increase in thunderstorm coverage as that really warm and moist air starts to infiltrate the lowest one to two kilometers of the atmosphere. It can very rapidly destabilize the atmosphere, and it can even maintain an unstable atmosphere even though you typically, even though you might have cooling taking place at ground level. By having this channel of warm, moist air coming in from the Gulf, you can actually maintain an unstable atmosphere even into the overnight hours. So this was kind of what I just alluded to. It can help maintain ongoing thunderstorms through the overnight hours. And this also plays a pretty instrument, instrumental role in the development of what we call mesoscale convective system, which are large complexes of thunderstorms that often form in the plains. And part of the reason those are so prominent in the plains is the fact that we have this low little jet bringing in a continual supply of warm and moist air, even though uh, the night, the nocturnal cycle of, uh, of the Earth's rotation wants to cool the air down, the slow level jet is trying to warm the air back up and make it and keep it unstable. And perhaps the one of the biggest physical consequences is if you've got an intense slow level jet that can produce strong both speed and directional shear in the lowest one to two kilometers. And this uh, has the potential to increase uh, the favorability of tornadoes. And also this can play a role in the formation of bow echoes, which uh, which is what you get out of squall lines. So a squ uh, bow echo is basically a an area of enhanced straight line winds that you find within a squall line. Low level jet can also lead to the formation of those. But typically our my main concern with low level jet is the increase in potential for tornadoes. Even if you've already got a squall line or a quasi linear convective system to begin with, once you introduce that strong low-level jet into the equation, then you can actually increase the potential for tornadoes to spin up within the line as well. So it increases tornado potential whether you've got uh, linear storms or isolated storms. And we'll, again, cover this in greater detail once we get to the severe weather unit. And another consequence that is maybe not talked about as often is a low-level jet can increase the potential for flash flooding, not just by increasing thunderstorm coverage, but also let's consider a, a hypothetical situation where you've got a nice stationary front and we've got a wind pattern that looks something like this. So it's a relatively weak wind pattern. And if you've got a strong front parallel component in the winds, and you're going to have thunderstorms all tracking over the same area as the thunderstorms right along this frontal boundary. But if you increase the southerly component, that's going to force the thunderstorms to hug the boundary even longer so that you get more of these thunderstorms tracking over the same areas and producing widespread heavy rain. And also it can uh, fuel and intensify uh, mesoscale convective systems, and those MCSs or mesoscale convective systems can also produce very heavy rain. So, low level jet has implications for tornado risk, straight line wind risk, as well as flood risk whenever you're uh, working with any sort of springtime or even off season severe weather event. But that's going to do it for this uh, talk about the low level jet. Um, and the next segment, we're going to discuss something called the African Easterly Jet, which has a very similar mechanism, but uh, it operates a little bit differently and has some different physical consequences. But that'll be the topic for the next segment, so I will see you all there.